Bruce, briefly, I want to make three key points. First, I think we really want to argue that we really must do experimentation to understand how the brain is working. Uh, they're, clearly, it's a Darwinian involved, uh, evolved object, and, and so what did Darwin, uh, Darwinian evolution do to make it what it is? And I think this is possible with cerebral organoids, as I said, uh, and this is highly speculative. They're stupid as hell right now, but maybe. So that's the second thing. And then I'm going to do something very foolish. I'm actually going to uh, talk about whether the math uh, that we're seeing in, in kind of counterstream brain circuits has anything to do with the math and quantum uh, information theory. A spoiler alert, the probably, the answer is they both use linear algebra, which is very boring answer. Okay, so we'll see how that comes out. All right. Um, so we uh, all are aware that there has been a very dramatic transformation of the brain uh, recently. Uh, I uh, have been totally fascinated with this uh, my whole life. I think we face, as a, in, in the world right now, we face the ability to enhance our brains not only by connecting them to the internet and devices in various ways, or if you believe Elon, you know, direct neural connection, uh, but uh, we also can genetically enhance them, possibly, and we have a huge thing to uh, discuss in terms of uh, uh, what the future is, but we better damn well know uh, how they work, and that will only be by understanding their genetic evolution and then interacting with them. So how did we get here? So this marvelous expansion of the human cerebral cortex started about 300 million years ago. You can see this from the, the 3 million years ago. You can see this from the fossil evidence quite clearly. Um, our divergence with our common answers with chimp was more than 6 million years ago. So about halfway through, uh, we started to get larger brains. Now, um, we can look in the genome, and there are regions that are associated with very uh, powerful um, neurodevelopmental disorders. Those are probably the regions that recently evolved and aren't quite uh, up to speed yet takes a long time for evolution to refine a new change. And secondly, we can literally study the expressions of the 20,000 genes when we look at how they're expressed during brain development uh, in the rhesus macaque, the chimp, and human. And so are there genes that behave differently during early brain development? The answer is yes, and we found one of them. This gene, notch to an L, showed up in our screen um, and uh, I remember my, my postdoc, Frank Jacobs, saying, well, this gene is really expressed gangbusters, that's the red on the left, in human neural development, and it's not at all expressed in macaque, uh, and it turned out it wasn't expressed in, in chimp. And the reason is that the gene isn't there in these species. Okay, so this is, it, you have to be a geneticist to understand. We have almost identical genes to chimp. It's, it's very bizarre to find a gene that we have uh, that Chimp doesn't have. Uh, but this, there it was, and uh, we traced its evolution, and it turned out that what happened is about 10 million years ago, there was a partial copy of a gene called Notch2, and that part of Notch2, which became notch 2 l was put in a different part of the genome. It actually jumped across the centromere of chromosome 1, and at that point, it was dead on arrival. But sometime, some ancestor about three million years ago, some human ancestor had a funny event where the Notch2 sequence overwrote that broken gene and revived it and made it into a protein coding gene. Uh, so that was a quite remarkable event, I will argue, in our evolution. Since then, us Denisovans, Neanderthals have this new gene. Now, uh, we can correlate the genetics with these fossil evidence. It, timing is just right for, um, for the evolution of larger brains. And I'll just jump to the summary. Uh, it turns out that it's very likely that this gene did, this random event, this evolutionary event, did play a role uh, in the evolution of human brain size. And what's interesting for this conference, right, so this must have happened so that we could survive at that time, not so we could understand quantum mechanics. So what are the, what, what are the limitations and the power of our brain? So the outer radio, radio glial cells are one part of the human neocortex that's quite distinct, although there's plenty of them in chimp and so forth, so it's not that those cells are unique to human, but we have more of them. And uh, they 
are a, a particular feature of this layered cortex. The ventricle is in the middle of your brain, and these uh, neurons develop in layers uh, going towards the surface uh, of your brain, and these outer radial glial cells are little factories that come on gangbusters in uh, human brain development. So what did we do being good biologists? We used CRISPR and we knocked this gene notch to an L out in embryonic stem cells. And then we grew cerebral organoids, which I will tell you a little bit more about now. So these are facsimiles of neural tissue that self-assembles, starting with uh, embryonic stem cells. And if you give them the right signals, they think they should develop a a uh, little bit of cortex, and you can see it stained with various genes that are only expressed in certain cortical layers. And you can do this in all of the different species that you see here. Uh, I guess just human and macaque here. And uh, it recapitulates this dynamic development where the outer radio radioglial cells appear, and then they start making the layers. And it goes through the first few layers, and then, uh, I have to admit, it kind of goes all to hell. So we can't really recapitulate all of uh, early brain development, but we can get uh, several of the layers and they already see something quite uh, distinct. And it's wonderful because, you know, we can knock out a gene or not knock out a gene and, and then see what happens. Uh, in other experiments, we showed uh, that this gene was actually essential in uh, this process of outer radial glial cell uh, production. So that's a further mechanistic hint that it must be involved in brain size determination. The problem is our uh, organoids aren't making neural circuits the way we would like them to be. So did it affect our neural circuit development? That's a big question. So this is what we're doing now. So second question is, can cerebral organoids help us? So if you're growing a little patch of human cortex in a dish, what can you learn from it? And can you scale that technology? Well, there's nothing out there. So we started doing 3D printing of uh, various platforms for looking at these things. We used uh, Raspberry Pi computers and cell phones and so forth to track the growth of our, our neurons. You have to understand that molecular biology is a cottage industry and they go out and buy $500,000 pieces of equipment to do experiments, hand one at a time and so forth. You really need to scale this up if we're ever gonna figure this problem out. Now the microscopes per pretty well, you can see the cells. Then we have to put the organoids on microelectrodes and the microelectrodes uh, sit in an array, and there's the squishy little organoid there. Here you can see an organoid. It's also being poached, poked by more conventional microelectrode arrays. Um, and there it is in being poked. Okay, so fine, we are going to struggle, and we hope that a whole community, which is rapidly evolving around cerebral organoids, will figure this out. What are we going to find when we do get them? Well, uh, okay, so we know a little bit how, about how the brain works, and this has been the in inspiration for neural networks for many years. The eye, for example, transmits information to the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, which goes on to the striate cortex. This is 1957. So we have information that is mapped from one part of the brain to another, and in each part of the brain, some kind of processing, a convolutional map uh, is evaluated um, in particular, in the, in the visual pathway, it breaks then to go uh, into the what pathway and the where pathway. Um, so the what pathway identifies objects in the scene and the where pathway uh, spatial relations. What's remarkable as we've gotten into the details now that we can map these wiring patterns very carefully, and this is a point I want to make importantly, that Every time there's a feed-forward architecture, like the classical one you see, which was the, which was the inspiration for Fukushima's neurocognitron in 1980, and also the, Fuka, the inspiration indirectly for Lynette and all the other uh, wonderful things that we have now, um, there's always a counter stream. So whatever goes feed forward, there's a map that goes backward. And this is not new, but this is something uh, that has been firmly confirmed uh, by looking at uh, network. So now let's jump into the models uh, to finish this off. So here's your conventional feed forward model. You have an experience which is a very large uh, component vector, sorry, the capital M, the small m component vector M is very large, and you go through a series of neural net uh, layers. 
Uh, each one of these you can imagine being an organoid, and then the information is transferred on to the next level and so forth by axon bundles. Finally, you get a small internal representation, uh, just like we heard about in the previous talk uh, from Suga. Uh, that um, internal representation is what you do to what you use to act on. You get a loss function, as we heard from Max, and then you differentiate that loss, and you can go back and change the parameters. Now, this thing is ostensibly a big linear thing, uh, but there's this magic non-linear pixie dust that we add here with these activation functions, right? And that gives it more power than a strictly linear thing. However, everything is such that we can differentiate and so forth, so we're happy with that. All right, so taking a big, big world and compressing it to, into a small dimensional internal representation. Okay, here's how a counterstream architecture works. You have the same feed forward on top, you get your internal representation, but for every stage where you're processing towards more and more abstract internal uh, representations, you also have a corresponding counterstream that's that is essentially working backwards. It's, it's recapitulating inputs that would have created the uh, compressed internal representation. I think about these as hallucinations or dreams. I think of an object, but my counterstream manifests it in more and more detail as I go back through my counterstreams. So this hallucinated input would be at the end, which would be, you know, think of a cat and get a cartoon of a cat or some, uh, some kind of representation of a cat. So that counterstream we claim is an important part. And these ovals represent these linked stages. So these, this is happening in the same neural tissue. Some people think in the same neurons, but it's certainly in, in adjacent neural tissue, each of these stages. So, crazy, okay, now it gets crazy and you tell me this is just linear algebra, all right? So we have this uh, input x, and we're converting it to an internal um, representation y of smaller dimension. Now, we're also creating a bold x, which is our hallucination of x. Now suppose we just take the outer product of x and bold x and put it through a series of quantum channels and then get some internal representation, which would in general be a superposition of smaller dimensional outer products. So we have the whole system is modeled by one big channel because you can compose quantum channels. And we say, that's the model. Think of phi, think of this uh, function. So what's the math? The key player would be a completely positive linear function phi mapping from an m by m matrix to an n by n matrix. So big matrix to small matrix. And we'll require that it map the big identity matrix to the small identity matrix. That means it's a, what's called a Heisenberg quantum channel. That's what's used for feed forward recognition. When you have that, it's called initial when it has that. Um, the adjoint of a initial uh, channel is a proper Schrodinger channel, i.e. trace conserving. Um, so, why would we work with matrices? Well, we want to compare uh, the, the hallucinated input to the actual input, and we want to be able to transform that. So what we think about the brain doing is, in an unsupervised mode, it's trying to make its hallucinated output match its actual input. Without any teacher, you can do that. In other words, the brain can learn to be able to simulate from its internal representation, something that's like what its actual input is. When you do that, this quantity, x, the outer product between your internal representation and your hallucination, um, as they approach each other, as they become similar, becomes positive definite, right? Because the, you know, the outer product of a vector with itself is positive definite. So as that becomes positive definite, the channel does its ma magic. A channel preserves positive definiteness and it's going to compress this big matrix down to a small matrix, which is a sum of outer products. Uh, you're gonna get the sum of outer products, which are these Ys, these internal representations. Okay, but wait, all right, so this is all nonlinear. So uh, hand wavy, we say that, well, somehow during this nonlinearity, the input gets mapped into some other Hilbert space, uh, and that's where the actual action is. Sorry, there's a LaTeX bug there, uh, didn't compile, but um, 
Now, you could think about this as, okay, if we can use something like the kernel trick from SVMs and we can compute in this high dimensional Hilbert space fast, then everything could work classically. Or you could say, well, maybe we're starting to do things quantumly, but I don't think that's true. We heard this morning. Um, probably what's happening here is regular BI, brain intelligence, rather than quantum AI. Um, so what do you do now? You learn from experience. Um, so if you think about your experience now, they're, they're, this is the italic X1, X2, up to Xn, but each one is accompanied by how you hallucinated it when you forwardly generated your hallucination of it. And if you add up the, the sum of those outer product, that represents your memories, hallucinations included. We'll assume the vectors are norm one. Um, so what we want to do, what do we want to do? Well, first of all, if we want to have good hallucinations, we want the trace of this matrix to be large. We want the vectors to be pointing in the same direction, so that's the number one thing. Secondly, this is like an encoder, right? So we're taking a very high dimensional world, going down to a internal representation, and then coming back again. So if we go from the internal representation out to our big representation, and then encode that back again to the internal representation, we want to get back to where we started from. That just gives you this uh, equation at optimum. Second thing is we can't do that the other way, but what we do want is that our memories are retrieved. So in addition to having the trace of M large so that the hallucination is similar to the reality, we want the norm of, this of the result of this process. Think about if we start with M or we take M we, de we decode it into a big representation, sorry, we, uh, we take M, we encode it, and then we decode it again. We want that uh, to be similar. So as a mathematician, you would probably use Hilbert-Schmidt norm here, but then with, you really you want it for functional survival in the wild, right? So that doesn't really, rec that doesn't, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm doesn't actually tell me that I'm going to, that my, my internal representations are going to make me survive. So probably there's a lot deeper thing here. But if you do the, the Hilbert, uh, Smith, Hilbert Schmidt norm here, you get essentially what Surya was just telling us about. So I don't have to go into any details here. <laughs> Principal component analysis, singular value decomposition, exactly what comes out of this model at this point, uh, which is, again, not surprising. It's all linear. Um, but I think what we heard from the previous talk is that even if it's slightly nonlinear, you're working in a linear regime and it tends to give something like, uh, like uh, principal components uh, analysis. So, so essentially this is um, projecting, your, your hidden representation is projecting uh, your inputs onto a vector space spanned by the eigenvalues of, eigenvectors of largest eigenvalue. Um, Maybe with a different norm, maybe with nonlinearity, you get something more. Um, I think this is exciting. Uh, and the nonlinearity is the key. How does the nonlinearity come in, and what did we evolve? What kind of nonlinearity did we evolve to make this uh, work, or what kind of different norm goes along with that? That's the key. And so um, it's not backprop, uh, and there are many other. Uh, direct algorithms now that have been proposed, I don't have time to go into them, but to train these counterstream architectures without backprop. Target prop is the main one. Uh, Bengio's got some great work on that, Hinton more recently. So I'm excited about these um, as well. Uh, let's, th this is just uh, additional stuff, we're out of time. Everything works great and it's linear when you work through this and when it's nonlinear, it's more complicated. So summary, so how is AI not human? It's not human uh, we, in a way that we don't understand because we don't understand human cognition. The best platform for doing that will be cerebral organoids. Uh, I want to contrast this just one quickly. Conventional neuroscience, or the most popular type of neuroscience, is listening in on a, on a mouse's brain and trying to model what's going on in the mouse's brain directly. I claim that's too hard. What we actually want to do is model a human brain with organoids and then try to model an organoid within silico simulation. An organoid is important because we can experiment on it much, much easier. Um, I want to thank 
all the people that work on this, both at UCSC and at UCSF. Thank you.